You're listening to episode 51 of the D6 Podcast. Here's the encouragement I give you. The shortest distance between your child's heart, your grown child's heart, and Christ is you. Parents need to own that they are the primary disciples of their child. Our goal in parenting is not for our kids ultimately to get a great education, as good as that is. Our goal is not for them to be great athletes. Our goal is not for them to go on great dates and have find a great husband or a great wife. Our goal is not for them to have a great career with a great job, making great money. Our goal is for them to love a great God. A great God, a great God. A great You're listening God. to the D6 Podcast. Here's your hosts, Ron Hunter and Jeremy Lee. This is the podcast that helps you build an excellent family ministry in your church. And today we're getting a little more specific, Ron. We're talking not just about family. We're talking about marriages, marriage. That's right. Marriage. That's right. In fact, you know, our, our guest today, Scott Kadersha, the first time I met one of his staff members, I didn't meet him first, I met somebody else, but their team has a saying. And when they talk about family ministry, they say that, you know, when they talk about working inside the children's areas, that the toxicity, if it exists in the marriage, it flows down to the children. So they spend a lot of time on creating a healthy marriage, which then turns into healthy children and those healthy families there. So their emphasis is what's upstream, is what I was leading up to say there. Yep. So many times a youth minister or a children's minister, they'll make the mistake that this has nothing to do with them. And that is flawed because, and I think it's pretty obvious when you spend some time just focusing on it, So many of the issues that the kids you are ministering to are facing are the consequences of the struggles in marriages. So therefore, marriage is not something you just get to check out on. When you minister to the parents in your ministry, one of the ways you minister to them is by encouraging their marriage. Lots of ways to do that. Like if you're a youth minister, have the kids do a mom and dad day out. Help them have a date and let the kids take care of the kids for free and let them have a date. Little things like that make a big difference. And you can do that as a ministry. That's right. And Encourage your families to attend marriage retreats, marriage conferences. There's some tremendous ones out there. And just like we need to change the oil on our car, we got to do maintenance on our marriage. Yeah, buy marriage books and hand them out to parents as gifts. There's a lot of ways we can get involved. And yeah, you're right. It's not your main focus if you're a children's minister or a youth minister, but it should be a focus. So it cannot be ignored. And it cannot be ignored, yes. Thankful Scott's here to help us with that today. And then also you have Sarah. You're going to be interviewing Sarah Cunningham, which is just a really, really smart lady. She is. She's super popular on uh, social media. But she has been studying community and relationships and how people connect and the value of those relationships. And, you know, when I first met Sarah, I just knew that this was a lady who really had this unique gift of aggregating people that don't know each other to become new best friends. And that's the best way I can describe Sarah. But as I've gotten to know her better, I've realized that she actually has a very intentional strategic plan for using this experience that she wants to turn into an academic study. Hmm. And it's really cool to watch her on this journey. It's going to be pretty significant what she finds. I have no idea. She's not going into it with a bias, which is the best part about the objectivity of this. But she's going to talk to us about the importance of community and relationships and what they mean to ministry. Okay. I got a little bit lost in that. I heard blah, 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 blah. She's awesome at networking, people. (laughs) You got oh, you, you went into your academic mode I did, there, Ryan. I did. Sorry, because <laughs> we, we talked about it. And I don't remember if we talked on or off the air about that, but we got into the mud on it to ourselves. And and yeah, I was all in. So yeah. I can I can see your PhD ness. Just, oh, just you're just sorry. I'll, I'll put just, it back. Put it back on. It's so, just yeah. firing now. Sarah, oh, yeah. Sarah yeah. challenges the intellect. I can yes. see. Uh, so anyway, let's put this in human terms. Really smart lady, Sarah Cunningham, is going to come talk about really smart things later in the show. You're going to love that. But before we get to it, we got Scott Kudersha after the break, talking marriage. We'll see you then. Are you looking for the right conference to attend this year? The D6 Conference is a family ministry conference designed for your entire ministry team. Come hear from over 30 speakers and network with churches that share your passion for reaching families. Family ministry isn't just another program. It's one of the most important things your church can do to make a difference in your city. 
At the D6 Conference, you'll be inspired and equipped to take your family ministry to the next level. To learn more about the D6 Conference, just go to d6conference.com. All right, everybody. We are so excited to have Scott Kadersha. I said that right. You got it right. That's oh, the first time. Yeah. He's impressed. the director of premarital and newly married ministry at Watermark Community Church in Dallas, yeah. Texas, a church that I've heard about for a long time in their episode right. of marriages. I can't wait to talk about this. For a decade, Scott has helped lead Merge. Watermark's premarital ministry, which is geared toward preparing seriously dating and engaged couples for marriage. And he's been married to Kristen since 2001. Four boys. Four. And your yeah. house is still yeah. standing. Yeah. That's great. I, th- I and think I've been gone yeah, a couple days. A couple so days. Sure. It might be burned down by yeah. now. But And he blogs on marriage and family and ministry, uh, books and reading at scottkadersha.com. You can Google that, too. But you can find him on his blog. And uh, he's most passionate about the local church, college football, uh, marriage, family, uh, community, and reading. And what is that college football team? Some of Wake Forest, Demon Deacon. And okay. Some years we have a team, some years we don't. All right. But I'm loyal. Good to deal. The old, old black and gold. Holding gold strong. Black, yeah. Holding yeah. strong in Texas. Yeah. Well, listen, I figured um, since we have a marriage minister basically with us, yeah. that today we would talk about how to build an awesome marriage marriage ministry. And I think it's a topic that. Really, every children's pastor, student pastor, family pastor, lead pastor, doesn't matter what role, should be thinking about for their church, even though so many don't. They get caught in the Sunday to Sunday, and they miss, like, the impact of a healthy marriage and what it can have on a home. And uh, because because if your church, you know, we believe your church has a a dynamic marriage ministry, it's going to have a direct impact on the kids yeah. that you invest in. So I'm excited to unpack this topic with you. And um, you have an eight-week class that you run and you kind of lead out with, with your team. What does that class cover when it comes to marriage ministry and premarital? And what else do you guys do in your ministry? Kind of yeah, unpack kind right. of the groundwork of what you guys are doing. Yeah, let me give you the, the overall big picture when yeah. we do marriage ministry. And so when we think about couples, whether, whether they are – Dating, engaged, married, we like to think of them in a few buckets. Yeah. And so essentially our, our focus as a marriage ministry is we prepare newlyweds. Mm-hmm. And when I say newlyweds, I mean engaged. And then even those couples that are seriously dating, we establish newlyweds. And so we take couples that are married zero to three years and we yeah. do everything we can to help them build their marriage on that Matthew 7, 24 through yeah. 27 foundation. We enrich and restore all marriages. And so we do that in a couple different ways. We prepare them through merge. Yes. We establish them through a small group ministry that we call foundation groups. Uh huh. We enrich through our community groups, through date nights, through conferences, uh, and then we also e- equip and restore through a ministry that we have called Reengage. Reengage is yep. what I've heard about. Yes. Yes, it's fantastic. Yes. It's, it's uh, a lot like uh, a recovery ministry uh-huh. for marriages, and provides an incredibly safe place for couples to find healing and hope. And we've just seen God do some incredible things. Whatever terrible crisis situation you can think of, we've had in reengage. Yes, yes. And just to hear the hope of Christ from the church. Well, let's talk about that in in the in the because people like me have heard about have heard about. Uh, it's called reengage, isn't right, it? Right, right. You know, we've heard about that, and that's when we think about marriage ministry, we think of crisis. Yeah. Uh, kind of unpack what do you do on the front end to prepare on that yeah. on the, uh, as you walk people through. Talk about that process because yeah. pastors are going to think, well, you just do premarital counseling. That's yeah. what you do. But talk about how what you do is more to prepare. It's good. So you just hit on that. That's this is what I'm so passionate yeah. about, most passionate about is is playing really good, really excuse me, really good offense. Absolutely, instead yeah. of defense. Yeah. Now you need both. You need yeah. offense and defense to win. And yeah. so a lot of churches do a great job defensively mm-hmm. of responding, but most churches don't really think about what we could do to play good offense. Mm. And so we do that through preparing our couples in merge. And so we teach about, you know, communication, money, in-laws, sexual intimacy, giving them God's design for marriage. Part of what we get to do there is that we might even break some couples up yeah. before they get engaged or before they get married. And we do everything we can so that they can go into marriage with the right focus and really understanding what marriage is. And so it's it's playing really good offense on the pre-married side. And then when they're when they're newlyweds, what we do is we just take them and we we looked at what 
couples who struggle in the long term yes. typically have issues with just not understanding what mm-hmm. commitment is. Mm-hmm. They struggle with money, with sex, with communication. Yep. They isolate. And so what we do with our newly married groups is we help them focus on all of those things. All yeah. the things that couples will struggle with down the road. We just say, what can we do proactively to build them up so that they don't end up in this crisis totally. down the road? And so just this big focus, again, on playing good offense. And then there's the the average couple who's not pre-married, who's not newly married. They're not in crisis. They're, they're just the regular couple that that has probably gotten a little bit passive and mm-hmm. lazy yeah. in their marriage. They don't yep. date each other anymore. On cruise control. Yeah, the kids are a higher priority than the marriage. Yep. And so we uh, re-engage can certainly help those couples, but we want to continue to help those couples grow in their marriage so that they don't end up in this this crisis mode where they're ready to give up, they're ready to sign divorce papers or separate, or or maybe even worse at times is just living together in a miserable existence. Yes. And not getting divorced, but living as if they're a divorced couple. Absolutely. Two separate lives going two separate directions. And the the reality is any church can do this. Yeah. Like that's yes. the real thing. As you think about marriage ministry, yeah. every church can do something yeah. more. Yeah. And something. Should be. It should be. It should be. You know, I was just hanging out with our children's pastor, my, one of my best friends, a guy named Wes. He leads, leads our children and family ministry. And he, you know, his direct quote to me this morning, unrelated to this conversation, was, "My job is so much better and easier and richer as a children's pastor." because of our marriage ministry. Mm-hmm. And so the church, if the church is not doing something to prepare, establish, enrich, and restore, then we're, we're not only affecting our marriages, but we're making the lives of our student and youth and children's ministry leaders miserable because they're dealing with the effects they of the sure are. marriage ministry. And we're actually multiplying, when we take these steps toward this, yeah. it's like we're multiplying the the ministry, the, the work of, we're multiplying the work of the Holy Spirit in the Sunday morning yeah. space. Yeah. We know that's sacred, and we know in the end the Lord's going to work in that moment where the teaching of the Word, but people who are working on their marriage and have that, at least have hope, yeah. they hear differently yeah. in the services. Yeah. And so there's just this multiplying effect. And so your children's pastors, your student pastors, all become agents of hope yeah. with linking arms with the marriage ministry. Like yeah. when they have crisis, right. they go, we're not sending you to a therapist, right. which, which there are times... We love, we, there are times where there's going to be a needed counselor yeah. or therapist in the role, but we're also hope dealers. We're like, hey, yeah. your marriage, God had a plan for putting you together. So, yeah. Well, let's talk about this because yeah. I'm going to get off on a soapbox um, if I'm not careful because I love this idea so much. How do we connect, how do ministers connect, uh, and how do you connect your marriage ministry with your church's process for hosting weddings? Because that's a big deal. Yeah. Sometimes that's a yeah. front door, like, I want to get married. Yeah. Welcome to welcome to not only our, our church and but our ministry for you. Yeah, yeah. So we, you know, a couple of things we do is that you've got to be a member of our church for us to officiate or host a wedding, and we just think it's it's poor stewardship of our leadership if we let a couple get married without doing everything we can to prepare them for marriage. Mm. If we're just to blindly you know meet with them one time and then. Uh, and, and then marry them. I think we're not leading them well. We're not loving them. We're not challenging them to have the hard conversations. Mm-hmm. And we're using the, the power that's been granted to us to, to marry a couple in, in a really poor way if we're not doing everything we can mm-hmm. you know, to prepare them for marriage. In some ways, this is, this is the, the second most important decision you'll ever make, I believe. The first yeah. is, is what God are you going to choose to follow? Yeah. And then second, who are you going to marry? And if the church doesn't step into that space help a couple, help them process, help them make all the decisions that they need to make, then we're, we're really missing out on a tremendous opportunity, not only to, to prepare couples, but to share the gospel as an outreach to our community. And so we've seen weddings and premarital prep reaches couples and folks who would never step foot into a church. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, and this brings up this segment, because that's so great, because really um, the marriage ministry that you guys have created one of the things that's beautiful about it is it mirrors the vision of the church. Yeah. And that's one of the warnings I would say to the to pastors out there is yeah. whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to propose to do in your church, it has to mirror the vision of the church. So talk about how you've linked the two 
you know, in your context? Yeah, so I think, you know, our overall strategy, we want to call all people to be fully devoted followers of Christ. We want to help them to be and make disciples. And so the way that we view marriage ministry is is one piece of how we make disciples. Mm. So yes. as we prepare couples for marriage, it's disciple making. As newlyweds, it's disciple making. When we enrich them, when we help them be restored within the church, it's making disciples. It's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And everything we do, that, that's the why mm. we do what we do. We do it a little bit different yep. based on yep. the stage of life, but it fits perfectly and should fit perfectly in any church's strategy. Because if, if we're to be about being and making disciples, the marriage ministry is one of the most strategic makes total and sense. obvious. Yeah. Because they're open to discipleship happens in context where real discipleship happens when people listen. Yes. I mean, Jesus said, hey, come follow me. Yeah. And people said, oh, okay. And at that moment, they may they may not have continued to follow, but at some point they followed. And so marriage, marriage, children, all those things are points where yeah. they'll listen. Let me ask you this, because I want to help anybody listening to this today. Yeah. Yeah. What are some ideas that ministers who are listening, literally, can straight up steal? Come on. Like they don't yeah. even have to like forget creativity. Yeah. Like just learn from Scott. What are some ideas <laughs> they can straight up skill, steal from you? to help make an awesome ministry, a uh, marriage ministry in their church. Yeah, that's great. So there's nothing new under the sun. That's right. Everything we use, we've stolen from other people. So yep. I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple of thoughts. One is, is with the newlyweds. Most churches probably already have some kind of Sunday school or small group mm -hmm. structure in place. Find some way specifically to target newlyweds. And so whether it's a zero to three year mm -hmm. range, often they're young couples. They're, uh, they've got nothing but time That's and right. money and space. And what a great chance to just get them together for them to realize the things we're going through, the communication struggles, yeah. the sex struggles. Normal. We're, we, absolutely. We're not, Normal. we're not the only ones That's going right. through this. Yeah. It's just like everyone else. That's great. And so start with your newlyweds, um, you know, date nights, anything you can do, mm -hmm. not, not just to, uh, you know, to, to help your couples, to remind them yep. to keep pursuing each other as a couple. Uh, you don't have to write your own stuff. There's no. so much great stuff out there. From married people to... Yeah, that's exactly right. Married what's marriedpeople.com? Is that I one think of them? .org, yeah. Yeah, yeah. .org. There's yeah. others. What? I mean, there's a few more. Yeah, so much great stuff that's already there. That Tons. Really just write. Google. Almost yeah. just search marriage resources, yeah. Christian, Christian marriage great, resources. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're when you're doing that, and there's there's people out there to help yeah. already. Yeah, and be discerning in that. I'm glad absolutely. you said that. There's so much stuff out there that, that's Christian. Yes. That doesn't teach scripture. That's, that's not right. about the gospel. And yes. so something I, I think a great thing to do proactively is just read, like, Tim Keller's book, mm -hmm. The Meaning oh. of Marriage. Unbelievable. So it makes me not want to ever write anything ever again because it's so good. And he has that effect on us. He does. Of he, everybody. That, you know, Ted Cunningham and yes. he writes, yes. Gary Thomas. There's so many great guys out there yep. that are writing incredible things. Just grab that and, and read it with a group of people. So many of those books have questions already in there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and then I'll, one little push, we'll talk about my blog in a few minutes. Yes. But I've got... Uh, a post. It's called 124 Killer Date Night Ideas. Yes. Did you get uh, that? Scott Kadersha dot com. A hundred ideas for date nights. 124. 124. Not just 100. Yes. Yeah, so that's Scott Kadersha dot com slash date night. You can download that. That'll Come help on. you like pursue each other. And they're creative. And that's dates. free. It's free. They're written around Dallas where I live. But, yeah. But most of the ideas are they transferable apply. anywhere. Yeah. Oh, that's it's beautiful. A quick win. Okay. Well, I want to make sure and hit this. What are some mistakes that uh, we can make in doing marriage. So talk, talk yeah. to me about the places you guys messed up yeah. so you can help us not do the same thing. Yeah. So my, my boss, John, has done a, a great job in, in leading in this, and uh, he's an innovator in so many ways. And so we've learned by making mistakes. And you've made mistakes. Innovators yeah. make mistakes. Yep. So if you, like, some people think they need to go out and write their own stuff right away. Mistake. To mention before, just use yep. the stuff that's there. Another would be not getting your lead pastor on board. Absolutely. You want his buy-in to, to, um, to be behind it and should be teaching about marriage. Uh, not believing in the power of the local church. Uh -huh. And so Second Peter 1.3, yes. know, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Yeah, what we do on the side for marriage ministry, it's just such a great reminder, yeah. in no way replaces what's happening yeah. in the body. Yeah. In fact, the two really go together. Go together, yeah. Yeah, the other one I'd say is just a lack of authenticity. Yeah. So, you know, I've been married to Kristen for 15 years, just celebrated 15. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, and it's normative. It, it, 1 Corinthians seven twenty eight says, if you marry, you will have trouble That's right. in this life. Oh. And so the struggle is normative. And so for us to pretend in any way that we've yes. got it all together, I mean, we're a mess. My wife's amazing. I'm a 
a lot more of a mess than she is. You're but, a Demon Deacon fan. Th- yeah, that's, that's, that's one said. of many reasons why. I'm a I mess. mean, what can we say? Yeah, and our you know four boys. Like yes, our, our house is a literal and figurative mess. Yeah, right. And, and you know we struggle with communication and uh, yeah, you know we're we're not authentic. We're not real. All the, you know so many issues, money issues. Mm-hmm. Even sometimes there's you know there's issues where things aren't as great in the bedroom or yeah. you know romance yeah. life and. And for me to hide and pretend, and if I'm leading it, then that's right. Then how is anyone else going to be? Don't fake. Yeah. Yes. Like it's yeah. we're not, and again, we're not leading people to a perfect, yeah. a perfect beautiful painting. Yeah. We're saying just have a great story. We're yeah. helping people through marriage have a yeah. a better story, aren't we? Yeah, my buddy Lance. I love the way he says this. He says people aren't looking for perfect examples; <laughs> they're looking for living examples. Real. And so just keep it real. And That's yeah. exactly right. It's okay to say, "Hey, I'm a mess." Okay, yeah. let me ask you this. Uh, uh, I love this because we're gonna have a lot of people who are thinking about parenting already yeah. um, and checking out your blog. Really, one of the posts that stood out was yeah. the most helpful advice I'd give a new parent. Now, you're a dad of four boys. Yeah. Let's go there because marriage, yeah. parenting, all that come together. What's your advice? Yeah. Give it to That's us. Good. Come on. All right. So we want to know. Bunch of things. So if I had to, I'm gonna give a couple, and then I'm gonna give you the one I Great. think is the most important. Okay. Right? So okay. One is you've got to continue to pursue each other. Yes. Just because you've got a kid doesn't mean you date does anymore. It doesn't mean you don't get away for a night or a weekend or a trip together every yep. year. Uh, you got to continue to pursue each other. Be romantic. Don't isolate. And start that when they're young. Yes. So how many parents? Yeah. How many families you know that wait? Yeah. They, so like they put, it's like they yeah. put dating on pause because yeah. they're so terrified to yeah. leave that baby with grandma or a friend. Yeah. That baby. Yeah. Tell them it'll be what? Fine. It'll be okay. Yeah. You're going to survive for thousands and thousands of years. Babies have survived without their parents. Unbelievable. For a so yeah. okay, that's a great that's a great yeah, start. So, you know, continue to pursue each other. Don't, just avoid isolation. Mm-hmm. There's a tendency that once we have a kid, that yes. we um, we want to pull back and withdraw and retreat. And that that's a time. There's a time you got to lean in mm-hmm. to community even more. Yes, it's when you've got your first kid. Uh, don't don't put things on hold in the bedroom. That's so right. The, there's a season. That's right. For six, eight weeks where you're not able yep. to be yep. intimate sexually, but there are still ways you, but you can can't serve and you got to work other. on it. Yeah, yep. that's right. And, and then I think, you know, one more and then I'll get to the big one. So just embracing the season of life. Mm-hmm. There's it's just so a many, season. Yeah, there's so many yeah. times when I thought, man, I can't wait until my child can do this. I can't wait till they can sleep through the night. Mm. And now with four kids that are anywhere from seven to 12, I miss those times when I can just cuddle and hold my baby. That's right. You know, yeah. in some ways I even miss those sleepless nights. Yeah. Just carrying them around. And I don't miss that, up. but yeah. keep going. Keep yeah, like maybe, maybe like one sleepless okay. night. Okay, okay, okay. Not, not a bunch of them. Yeah. <laughs> so well, give us the number one. Now we got what's the, the most important Yeah, there's advice. no question. So if you're going to – the other stuff's important, but the most important is you've got – to be selfless. Yeah. You got to put the other's need before your own. So mm, it's Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Uh, you know, it's a matter of saying, I, I know I'm tired right now, but man, my wife is probably more tired than I am. Mm. And so I'm going to take the baby. I'm going to get up in the middle of the night. I'm going to change a diaper. I'm going to go the extra mile. And then that goes both ways. That's not just the guy serving that's his right. wife. No, but, that's right. But putting the other's needs before our own. And, and yeah. We do that solely when we look at the example of Christ. That's oh, right? that's it's, incredible. It's Philippians two five through eleven that we we look at. I, I just keep coming back to that passage in every stage of my life because I need to be reminded not just to be selfless. Yes. But the way I do that is by looking at the example of Christ. So, <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for this last question. All right. Another post that that kind of caught our team's eye was this. The most important topic to be discussed in your relationship. You work with a lot of couples. Um, what's that topic and yeah. why? Yeah, and so I think this is one that couples don't know how to talk about. Right, for pre it's often like we're attracted to each other, we have fun with each other, mm-hmm. we enjoy being with each other, but we don't know how to talk about this. For married couples, we don't know how to talk about it. And it's just, it, it's incredibly intimate. And I'm not talking about sex, I'm talking about spiritual intimacy. Yeah. Where we talk about our relationship with Christ. Mm-hmm. Right, so for pre that ought to be the first part of your conversation. Mm-hmm. Don't go out with someone who's just good looking and makes a lot of money or, you know, you're attracted to them in every way. Mm-hmm. You gotta know more about their character. That's right. Are are they fully surrendered to the Lord? And for many couples, I see that that's like not conversation one, that's conversation fifty. Have, that is hundred percent true. Yeah, that your is exactly right. So connected and you love being with each other. Yeah. And, 
and that that should be the top of the list. Yeah. And then for married couples, I think we just don't know how. Yeah. We don't know how to share. You know, here's what maybe each each uh, the husband and wife is having a quiet time. They're learning mm-hmm. something, but they're not talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we don't. They're not that. coming home after church, going, yep. "Hey, That's, one thing yes. you what's one thing you took away this yep. morning?" And even if it's nothing, yep. it's okay. Sometimes we're going to have those yep. weeks where yep. we go. I don't know. You know, Tom Brady got hurt that's in the first quarter, and I, I didn't yeah. bench him on fantasy team. Yes. Maybe that's that Sunday. But yeah. just ask simple question. Yeah. It's such a big deal. Yeah. But you're exactly right. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah, it becomes like peripheral to a relationship instead of central to it. And it's, so. it's absolutely central. Yeah. Okay. It's good. This has been unbelievable. Thanks. Okay, so yeah. – the if if you're watching this, if you're out there, if you're listening, you can go to scottkadersha dot com, and all kinds of resources there, and all yeah. kinds of of you've just kind of chronicled your journey, haven't yeah, you? A little bit, yeah. So you can go learn, you can go think, um, and uh, I just challenge everybody listening to think about this. Yeah. And so, um, thank you so much thanks. for what you do for the kingdom, what your church does, awesome. and thanks for being with us thanks, today. Man. Love being here, Mike. Awesome, thanks, thanks. man. Appreciate it. Could multiply your ministry 168 times over. We have a way for you to do that today. We believe that true discipleship is attained through diligently studying God's Word and applying the Scriptures to your daily life. Spending one hour each week out of 168 in a worship service is simply not enough. D6 Devotional Study Guides are here to help. Each week, everyone in your family studies the same theme with lessons and devotions appropriate to each age level. Moms and dads will love the devotions and articles as conversation starters. Children will love reading and playing games in their own devotional study guide. Families will love spending time together during the week discussing and studying the scriptures. To learn more about the D6 devotional magazines, you can go to d6family.com slash d6 curriculum. So Scott, I thank you. My marriage, my wife probably thanks you. Thank you for the help with my marriage. Oh. This is one of the reasons why I love this podcast because we can have stuff like that, uh, great insight like that on things that are so vital like marriage. So thank you, mm-hmm. Scott. Thank you for taking some time to serve awesome our stuff. audience and serve us. And uh, Ron, I know we have Sarah, and I know you've given us such a great <laughs> introduction to Sarah, but can, in human terms, can you please rewind and let us know what we're about to hear? Yeah, you know, she's talking about how do you build relationships. There you go. That's the word you're looking for. <laughs> and when she talked about interviewing 200 people, wow, that just got my, as yeah, you said, my academic wheels rolling. Like, okay, now we have comparative data. Okay, okay, that's enough. Let's, okay, talk, okay, let's hear okay. from Sarah. <laughs> let's do it. Here we have Sarah Cunningham. All right, we're sitting here with Sarah Cunningham. Sarah has been a uh, friend, a social media strategist, an an author and uh, speaker for D6, and uh, quite a phenomenal lady. Uh, She has two boys. They are seven and four, and she likes to call herself the chief servant of the emperor, her seven-year-old justice, and his chief of staff, her four-year-old son, Mac. She's an author. She's an educator. She's quite a phenomenal individual and a researcher all of her own. Sarah, welcome to the D6 Podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Ron. Yeah. You know, you have uh, just relaunched your website, sarahcunningham.org, and you're doing some things differently. Is it too early for us to ask, what are you doing? No, this is perfect timing to ask what I'm doing, actually. Even just this week, I kind of rebranded the website to reflect my current stage. Uh, The last two years, I've spent interviewing 200 people about their communities, uh, how they make friends, how they keep friends, even how they lose friendships and connections. And basically, I've been pouring over these interviews and trying to determine What helps the people who are satisfied socially, who experience good support and care? Like what 
what practices, best practices are and habits do they have that lead to that good experience? And then I'm also listening for the attitudes and habits that lead to low quality connections. Um, and the hope is to generate information that a lot of us probably were never formally taught. I find that a lot of people learn about how to connect with others through like piecemealing together, trial and error during middle school, things their Sunday school teacher or their parents taught them, maybe even learning from TV or the movies, which isn't always the most realistic source of, oh, yeah. of information. Yeah. And then it has implications for everyone, but especially for the church, who's obviously challenged to build relationships relationships with diverse people groups around the world. And I see the road to the Great Commission kind of going right through those relationships. And so I've launched a podcast and have some YouTube videos and a Periscope community that are all geared towards helping people improve their social health and restore connectedness in our communities. Mm. So in this process, as you're examining what practices contribute to high-quality connections, are you distinguishing the difference between introverts and extroverts? I mean, extroverts tend to do that naturally. I'm not sure if they always create healthy ones, Mm. but any thoughts on just comparing those two personality types? Well, there's certainly a lot of observations related to personality types, but the way I've approached it is it's a qualitative interview, which means I'm kind of not allowed to bring anything to the interview to as a personal bias or filter. So I'm kind of supposed to push away any preconceived categories I have and, and listen to people's experiences. And then as I hear threads of commonality come up from interview to interview, for example, I hear a lot of people saying when I hit adulthood, friendship became a lot harder. Mm -hmm. I didn't come into interviews looking for that piece of information, but I heard it so many times that I just started to track that. And there's a whole lot of other insights like that that have kind of stood out very obviously. You can't miss them as you talk to that many people. Wow. How insightful. I mean, you're mining some great content. What are you going to do with all this content? So the podcast is called Truth or Dare, and it basically interviews leading social experts and asks them to share some social truths as well as dare the listeners to apply them. And then I've also been taking some of the really basic practical stuff and putting it into these short YouTube videos and these mini Periscope sessions where people can get on live and just get a quick little social tip uh, a couple times a week. It's really moved by my faith story. I've written a lot about connecting people to each other. And when I look at the Bible, I feel like the ideal of living in connection is God's design. It's not mine. Mm. So talk about living in connection. How, How does this tie back in with our connection with God? You know, I've always been so fascinated by community and how God works in community. And it's taken me many, many years of writing and exploring this to kind of come to a place where I can even explain it. I just think from the very beginning, right, God made humans to be each other's companions and he called it good. And his first charge to the world was multiply. Like we need more people, fill the earth, settle in together, care for the world. And then then you go on to the Old Testament and the way Israel was designed to function. And you remember like from the Old Testament laws, from even from the 10 commandments, the first four are about connection to God, the next six are about connection to other people. And there were all kinds of provisions in the law to care for widows and orphans and foreigners. And then you think about God's covenant to Abraham, you know, we're supposed to be a blessing to all people, all all families of the world will be blessed through him, to Jesus coming, God in flesh, right? Emmanuel, God with us, a savior who said things like to the unclean woman, daughter, your faith has made you well, or said, those of you who are following or seeking after God, you are like my mother and my sister and my brother. And I just hear all of that language. And to me, it just culminates in this idea that um, God wants us to live in community. That's where we're most vital, most healthy. And it's a great message for where we're at today in our country, because there's so much division and clash going on that it's a really good thing for me to be able to step back and think about God's intentions for us in those moments. So what does, you know, we can talk about living in community, but talk about us entering that community of connectedness. What do we bring and what do we get? Final question here as we kind of think through that. What do we bring to that community and what do we get from that community as it relates to our faith story? Yeah, you know, 
sometimes people ask, how does God speak to you? And I find that in most everyday moments, God doesn't speak to me in big, audible, you know, lightning bolt in the sky kinds of ways. But the people around me that I'm in relationship with have so many times served as kind of prophets in my life who have taught me either in the classroom of our relationship or by their feedback to me about how God might relate to me as well. So I have a real appreciation for how God works in each of us and also in our relationships. Very good. Very good. So if you want to learn more about this exploration and this journey that Sarah is on, go to sarahcunningham.org and you can explore more about how you can become more healthy and intentional connections in your community. Does that sound right, Sarah? Sounds perfect. Thank you so much, Ron. Man, thanks for being a part of the podcast. Thanks for helping us. I, I, need, to, I need to dive in a little further on this. Those uh, connections do not come natural to me, and I'm sure they don't come natural to everybody else. So I look forward to learning with you on this journey. See, Sarah's far more interesting than I am talking about <laughs> Sarah, isn't she? <laughs> Way to go, Sarah. Thank you so much. Seriously. That's right. In spite of Ron's introduction, Sarah killed it. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, I hope that you heard from her about how to tie that back into your story, how to build community and connect to other people's stories. That's really, you know, the essence of her, her intent and how to help us. And if you go back and tie this back into other interviews that we've had along the way, we can't do ministry without relationships, without right. community. And so people with Sarah's expertise really makes us easy, reminds us what we need to be working on, especially when it doesn't come natural to somebody like me. Mm, mm, I love it. Well, it's turned out to be such a great episode, and I'm thankful for it. And next week, our topic is going to be one of those topics that is like this niche and focused topic. We have Gordon Becky West talking about how to plan a family mission trip. But I hope you'll mark it down and make sure to listen because it might just change your program. You might consider adding a cool new event. They sure do have a lot to teach us about that. And then, Ron, we have Michael Covington. Michael Covington, an absolute technical guru. He's the head of Discipler for David C. Cook. And he's going to talk about how do we monitor or throttle our kids' electronic habits. Nice. That's something that lots of parents want to hear about. So mark that episode down. We'll see you guys next week yet again. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you have a great week of ministry. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com. And if you're a minister, we invite you to join the D6 Leader Network by going to d6leadernetwork.com. 